Hey everyone, quick video today talking about checks on the judicial branch. So now we've kind of taken a look at, you know, what the judicial branch does, what are its specific powers, and now we're going to take a look at how the other branches of government, um, specifically the legislative or Congress and executive or president, and how they interact with the judicial branch and the Supreme Court. Oops. So your goal for this video is to be able to explain how the other branches of government can limit the Supreme Court's power. Okay. Um, all right, so let's go ahead and start first with that confirmation process um, that we um, talked about at the very beginning of this unit. Remember that the confirmation process in itself is a check on the Supreme Court because it does involve the other two branches of government, right? The Supreme Court doesn't nominate itself. Um, how a person gets to the Supreme Court has to go through both the president and the Senate of the legislative branch. So remember, the first step in this process is that the president will appoint someone to that position. And remember, usually that person is someone who is ideologically similar to the president, right? If the president is liberal, they'll nominate a liberal justice versus conservative and a conservative justice. Um, but the person has more uh, of a chance to be confirmed, as we'll see in a minute, if they are not extreme in their views. So the president, when making the decision, often does choose someone who, yes, is similar to them, but does not share or does not have some, you know, ideologically extreme views. Reason being is that the president knows that if that justice that they've appointed or nominated has extreme views, it is less likely that they will be confirmed by the Senate. And the Senate, as we will see, confirms that nomination or appointment. And the Senate actually has quite a bit of power um, and can be pretty selective uh, when it comes to you know, confirming and checking the president in how it um, uh, you know, confirms people to the Supreme Court. So uh, this power of the Senate can be seen in the example from 2016. Um, and we're going to talk about a guy named Merrick Garland and what happened with him. And I, I want you guys to think about just how much power the Senate had in this, in this situation. So in 2016, um, and this is like pretty early in 2016, uh, Justice Scalia, who we listened to in that video, he ended up um, passing away. So there was a vacancy on the bench. Now, 2016, as you know, was an election year. And Republican candidates in the primary agreed that it should be the next president to appoint Scalia's replacement. Um, now, Obama was in his final year. He actually still had 10 months left. Um, and, you know, the, the kind of debate was, should President Obama in his final final term, final days, essentially final 10 months, be the one to nominate another person to this all-powerful court. Um, what ended up happening, uh, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, who is uh, at the time of this video at least still the Senate Majority Leader, is going to announce that the Senate would not hold a vote until the voters elected a new president. So basically what he said is he's going to postpone the vote and hold off on the vote, um, which he is absolutely in his right to do, as we will see constitutionally. So what ended up happening is Obama nominated Judge Merrick Garland um, and the Senate refused to have a confirmation hearing. So we actually had in 2016, a 10 month vacancy on the court. Um, the Supreme Court can operate with a vacancy with eight justices. It's not ideal. And 10 months is a pretty long time, but it, it has happened, obviously. Now, constitutionally, nothing mandates a timeline on the Senate's confirmation process. So that is what I mean in the power of the Senate. The Senate kind of decides when those confirmation hearings happen and you know if, you know, if they happened, as was the case for Merrick Garland, who, as you guys probably know, President Trump won the election, right? And then nominated Neil Gorsuch um, after his inauguration, who was then confirmed. So Garland never got a seat on the Supreme Court. Impeachment is also a check, um, right? Keeping that principle of limited government, preventing abuse of power. 
Federal judges who act criminally uh, and or unethically, depending on what the situation is, can be impeached um, and removed from office. So that is, and that is the same for the president as well, as we will see. But um, one of the things that I think is really important is that this impeachment is really a, a pretty big check on life terms, right? It prevents a justice uh, from you know, abusing that power over a, a very long period of time, especially when they don't have the, you know, elections like other representatives and the president do. Um, and then just know that this is a congressional um, check on the Supreme Court. So this is the legislative branch checking the Supreme Court. Congress actually does a couple of checks on the Supreme Court, actually, now that I'm thinking about it, and we're going to talk about those. Um, Congress is responsible for redefining jurisdiction of the court. Congress in the Constitution is given the power to establish all lower courts, um, alter the jurisdiction of the court, and how many justices are on the court, which is why uh, FDR's court packing attempt was just an attempt, right? It didn't go through. It's not the president that decides, it's Congress. So when I mean jurisdiction, what I'm talking about here, guys, is what types of cases are heard where. Congress defines what type of cases are heard by which federal courts and which types of cases are left to the state courts. So that is a pretty big, uh, you know, power on the Supreme Court. Uh, and, and then the federal courts themselves, you know, deciding what kinds of cases they can hear. Um, and they can strip courts of jurisdiction, which has happened as well. Congress um, also has the ability, um, as we've kind of looked at, like in Unit 1, uh, along with the states, to amend the Constitution or pass a new or revised piece of legislation if the court finds a law unconstitutional, right? So let's say Congress is unhappy with the way that the court ruled in a certain situation. Um, they can propose an amendment that the states can then ratify or they can revise or amend the piece of legislation or even pass a new one to kind of get around and circumnavigate that court decision. So for example, um, the actually it's, it's interesting, um, the income tax was actually ruled unconstitutional for a very long time. And we actually see uh, Congress, along with the states, because it's a federalist system, right, the states have to ratify an amendment, but we see the 16th Amendment ratified to the Constitution, which gives validity to a federal income tax, and that is what gets around the court finding that unconstitutional. Congress is basically like, okay, if you declare it unconstitutional, how about we add it into the Constitution? And of course, that is now a piece that we have to abide by. Um, I would say just so that you know, this is hard to do. Amending the constitution is not an easy process because you have to have Congress as well as three fourths of the states on board, which is not easy. Uh, you know, the most common way I would say that a, that, you know, if, if a body of government like the, the Congress or the president dislikes a way, the way the court rules passing a new or revised piece of legislation is going to be your most common method. Um, so if I were you guys, I would probably like star or highlight that piece because that's going to be the most common. And that, I mean, that is fair game for an FRQ as well. And then finally, um, I think we've talked about this before, but, you know, the Supreme Court in itself has a weakness of it has no enforcement power, right? The whole purpose of the court is to interpret the constitution. It has the power to say what the law is. It does not have any power to enforce or implement decisions. It's going to rely on the other branches of government to then carry out those decisions. So Brown versus Board of Education, I told you guys this case is gonna keep coming up for like always in this class. Uh, this is a big example of a weakness of the court and how it relies on the other branches. So if you remember, Brown versus Board of Education is going to rule that segregation in schools is unconstitutional because separate but equal is not constitutional, right? Separate but equal is inherently unequal. Now, this decision was socially celebrated, right? This was seen as like a very progressive decision by the court. 
But as you guys probably know from history, it was not necessarily implemented as quickly as people may have liked to see, right? Um, ultimately, segregation or excuse me, desegregation and integration of schools moved very slowly, especially in the South. Uh, and and the, you know the deeper South you went, the slower this was happening, and the more obstacles people of color faced, you know, amidst this Supreme Court decision. Um, there were legal obstacles put in place preventing desegregation. School districts put in loopholes, um, like they would add, or I should say they would um, remove all uh, teachers of color and add white teachers, and that would count the school as quote-unquote integrated. We see a lot of these de facto segregation policies, or not legal, but just happening kind of as a result. Um leading to this gap in educational opportunities, right? And in the South and in a lot of areas in the country, you know, we saw a lot of pushback, not only from, you know, local authorities, state authorities, uh, but also, you know, students and parents themselves, like everyday citizens. So just because this, the Supreme Court ruled that this was not constitutional does not necessarily mean that it happened overnight. Um, and in fact, I bring this up a lot, but if you remember from American history talking about the Little Rock Nine, right? These were the nine African-American students who were selected to integrate Little Rock High School. And the governor of Arkansas in 1957, so after Brown, three years after Brown, ordered his state's National Guard to block those Black students from entering the high school. So the governor was actively you know, disregarding this Supreme Court's decision. Now, on the flip side here, we then see President Dwight Eisenhower, the executive branch, the federal executive branch, federalizing that National Guard and saying, nope, you are no longer under control of the Arkansas governor. You are now under my command. And my command is that you go in and escort those students into the formerly all-white high school. And that's what happened. So on one hand, it's a, it's a weird situation, right? You have uh, a state executive refusing to implement the law or the, the ruling. At the same time, then you have the federal executive, the president, um, you know, endorsing and actually supporting that ruling. So that was kind of a, 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 a difference there. All right, guys, remember your goal was to explain how the other branches of government can limit the Supreme Court's power. So make sure and go back if you need to listen to any of the examples again to get those filled in. Remember that your notes are graded on being complete and thorough. So you need those boxes filled in. And let me know if you guys have any questions. If you are not in class when these are due, please remember to upload photos of your completed notes to the Google form. Uh, linked in this video or on Google Classroom. See you guys later.